Okay, everyone. Hello, good morning. So let's start in a minute. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session, Hidden Aspects of Digital Inclusion. My name is Steffen Leidl. I am Head of Digital at Deutsche Welle Academy and the moderator of this session. And uh, I also want to give a very warm welcome to our panelists here. I'm happy to uh, introduce you in a few moments. Um, maybe a few words about Deutsche Welle Academy. I'm, you might be familiar with Deutsche Welle, the international broadcast of Germany, and we also have a media development uh, institution. It's called Deutsche Welle Academy, so we do media development in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Middle East. And what is this session about? Um, so this is thought to be a breakout group discussion. So we want to have some interaction, not just words from me and the panelists. So we will have a first part of input. I'm going to give a little intro on how we as Deutsche Welle Academy are defining digital participation and working on this topic. And then we have our experts' interventions, each of them five minutes. I will be a rough timekeeper because we have 90 minutes and also want to have time for discussion and after that we are going to have some group discussion so that you can talk um, together and you also can have exchange with the experts. So um, let's start with the content. I mean we could ask ourselves okay what digital world do we live in and I think one of the lessons we learned at Deutsche Welle Academy is that digital participation is not at all a technical issue. There are so many factors defining if people can participate or not. And I would like to start with a little quiz, so test your knowledge. Um, I would ask you three questions and you give me the answer by raising your arms. So the first question would be, what do you think, how many people worldwide live under governments that disconnected internet, mobile networks, often for political reasons. There are two, 17%, 42%. Who says 17%? Nobody, you are all. 42%, okay, you're correct. I mean, you are experts, and this are new, uh, da is new data from Freedom House in the new Freedom on the Net report. The other thing is, for example, if you look uh, at the affordability, um, issue. What do you think in Uganda? What is the price of one gigabyte mobile data as percentage of the average income in Uganda? Is it 2.5 or 16.2? What do you think? 2.5? Nobody? You are also experts. 16 percent? Correct answer. But it's, I mean, we have to imagine 2.5 is South Africa, for example, and we have in Africa um, also countries that are far more expensive, for example Zimbabwe, I think it's around 30 percent and this is a new very interesting report just released from the Alliance of Affordable Internet a few, a couple of days or weeks ago. So it's, uh, I really recommend to read it. And the last question is about Wikipedia and you know it's a big topic that we have English as a, as a very important language, Chinese, Spanish, and but there are so many languages that in the world, I mean we have around six to seven thousand languages. What do you think how many 
uh, language editions exist on Wikipedia, 43 or 292? 43? Okay. 292. So there's uh, re some reason for optimism, at least here. It's, uh, there are definitely 292 active language editions, but if you compare it still with this 6,000 languages in the world, it's still very few. Um, so, as we have seen, digital participation is a topic that is really diverse and um, there's no easy way to say if a country has a high or a low, low level of digital inclusion or digital participation. Um, so, we look as Deutsche Welle Academy, as, we, as I said, we work in around 50 countries in developing and emerging countries. Uh, we started a project to measure, in a way, digital participation. We call it um, the Speak Up Barometer. So what we do is we are assessing at the moment eight countries, three countries in Africa. One we have already done is Uganda. And what we look is, um, okay, how, is, how can we describe the level of digital participation. We develop, developed a special model for, um, for um, the measurement of digital participation. Uh, I don't want to dig too deep because we want, don't have the time to go to the method in detail, but you can read everything on our website. But just to tell you a little bit how we approach digital participation. So we say, okay, um, in the digital world you have like data, you have content, you have services, you have code. Um, and there are different, very different types how you can participate. So you can, for example, take content. You can just consume it as a user. You can create content, but you also can share and govern content. And for us also an important aspect is you can innovate. So we think innovation can be a really important driver uh, for digital participation. So, um, and when we now look at how we measure digital participation, what we consider are like five clusters or five thematic areas. So we look at topics of access, topics of media and journalism, topics of society, digital rights and innovation. So we, we develop a kind of questionnaire of around 100 questions we ask in each country, uh, based on expert interviews, field research, and also desk research. And for example, access, of course, we check all the technical things. How is the infrastructure? Is there public internet? How is the affordability, for example? Very important for us is the digital rights topic. So we look at the freedom of speech laws. We check, for example, okay, is there what about the internet governance topics? Is there, for example, regional internet governance forum, for example? And for us, of course, the traditional cluster we are really strong is the media and development, uh, sorry, media and journalism cluster, because, of course, we do media development. And what we do there is analyze a little bit, okay, what do the media do? Are there independent media? Are there civic media? Uh, public service broadcasting, for example. And more and more important is the society cluster because, of course, in many countries, you know, s cultural norms are determining if somebody can participate or not in the Internet. I mean, if we have the gender topic, we have the language topic, for example. And the last one is the innovation thing. Um, that, as I said, okay, it's really interesting that we have in many countries in Latin America or Africa, we have so great ideas so, and great projects, uh, especially in the media ecosystem. So um, we are very, really interested how do these you know, innovative actors influencing the whole system. So th this we do on the basis, as I said, of expert interviews. We use a broad range of experts, for example, from the innovators to investigative journalists to community reporters because for us also it's important the user perspective. What does people say that live in rural areas and they don't have access really? So some of our outcomes or, or, or previous results we have is for example that disinformation becomes an industry. This is really a, a terrible topic that we have a professionalization of, of disinformation. In, in Mexico, for example, you can 
hire agencies to, to, for hate speech, for example, and not only in Mexico. We have in Kenya a, a big problem. I'm not sure if people from Kenya are here. We have a big problem with hate speech, for example. And this done in a very professional way. Yeah? Uh, another thing, of course, is this social, uh, this social media taxation topic. Um, more and more countries are discovering this topic as a way of, um, yeah, <laughs> to determine or to limit freedom of speech. It's not just Uganda. But there are also positive developments. We don't only want to talk about the negative things. For example, of course we have, as I said, these innovative actors uh, everywhere and also we have the social media innovators in many countries that are bringing in really good ideas um, on how people can participate. Okay, so I talked a lot, so now I would like to introduce our experts. And um, first um, is Sarah Kinnon from Uganda. Um, I'm happy you are here. Sarah, um, you are a technologist and researcher. You like a lot open source and you work on internet policy and you were a Ford Mozilla Open Web Fellow. And now you're working on an, an internet measurement project focusing on broadband performance, internet peering, and user behavior. And I ask all of our panelists to give a little statement, or initial statement, and you say social media and mobile money tax will lead to exploding costs and drop in internet use for those who are already unprivileged. Hello, Sarah. Um, Talal. Hello, Salah. You are from Pakistan and you work for, as a project manager for Media Matters for Democracy in Pakistan. And you're also an expert on digital rights. And you lead, at the moment, you lead an initiative we found really interesting is um, that you are fostering media and journalists' capacities to report on digital rights issues. And you say that cybercrime laws are used as a tool to enforce self censorship of critical voices. And Daniel, uh, from US, Daniel is, um, we are working a lot together, SEMA and Deutsche Welle Academy. He's associate editor at the Center for International Media Assistance. And Daniel specializes in the global media environment and also in internet policy. And he conducts research on internet governance and the implications of new digital technologies on media systems worldwide. I do say that social media platforms are as new gatekeepers of content, make it easier for governments to censor content. And I also want to welcome Osama from, from India. Um, he's founder of the Digital Empowerment Foundation and your mission is to eradicate information poverty in India and the Global South by using digital tools. And he's also an expert on digital literacy. I mean, digital literacy, media information literacy, as we call it at Deutsche Welle Academy, is a very important uh, a line of work. And you are part of a new network we created on media information literacy uh, called Mill Network. And you say misinformation is a curse for the society in the 21st century connected world, mainly spread by political parties using social media. But ultimately, it is a so societal problem, it, and it has to be solved by society itself. And last but not least, Mary Rose of Yanga Rontel from Philippines. I'm so happy you jumped in because unfortunately, um, Rachel Sibande, she can't be here. Um, um, she's sick, so, uh, but you jumped in and I'm really happy that you are here because you have done great innovative work. You, you founded a, a project called Women Powered Institute um, that provides opportunities for women to excel in the digital economy through training and community events. Um, and you say innovation in the digital space is happening, but limited access to internet is preventing it at a larger scale, especially for women in Philippines. So this is our, our panelists, and now, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> I would ask each of them to give a little intervention, really only five minutes. As I said, uh, we have some cards prepared. A yellow card means four minutes. And red card is please come to an end, because we really want to have space later on for the dis group discussions. So please, Sarah, I would like you to start. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you are OK. I'm happy to talk to you about access. 
because it's something that's passionate to me in the recent past. I like to tell the story that I, got I, I first got the access to the internet at the age of 12, and I count myself lucky because not so many people from my region actually have this kind of privilege that I got. So I, I also want to use this analogy. Just imagine the internet as a big jigsaw puzzle spread across the world. If you imagine the internet like that, you will discover that there are holes, very, very big holes, and that means we can't get a full vivid picture of who we are, what's out there, and the aspect of our lives. Before we go any further, I would like to give you good news and bad news that you already know, but I think a constant reminder will help us to push for better. The good news is that half of the, internet, half of the world's population has access to the internet, and of course the bad news is that the other half does not. So we need this constant reminder because it will help us to push for better. But if you look at other regions, for example, if you go to Africa, this statistic is even worse, so it goes to less than 36% of the people have access. And recent studies are even showing that the number is worse because regulators and operators are actually counting number of active SIM cards instead of counting how many people are connected. So for example, if I have three SIM cards, they'll count that these are three separate people, which is not, I don't know how to count that, but I don't think that's the right way you would count how many people are connected to the internet. But it's also important to note that the internet has been said to have the potential to change our lives, so to give us access to better health care, jobs, um, help uh, improve our standards of living, but if half of the world's population doesn't have access to something that's very powerful to change our lives, I think that is very, very absurd. So when you talk about digital inclusion, you can't say we are talking about inclusion when there are people who are already excluded, they are not here, so you, you can't even begin to plan for people who are not there. So I think we need to think about these people as we plan. And there are so many challenges and threats and the one about social media, the way I'm um, calling social media right now. I think we've started to see that very many governments right now want to start charging people for social media, social media tax and mobile money tax. I saw them in Uganda, in Zambia, in Benin. And in the case of Benin, actually, the cost went up by over 200 percent, which is really, really absurd. So there's already a barrier to access. I think one of the biggest challenges for people not to be online is access, cost of access. They don't have money to be online. So then you increase it by over 200 percent. You're basically adding I don't know how many more layers and making it very hard for people to join. So I think uh, some of these policies need to, to change. I don't know if you heard about the one for Tanzania where they said that for someone, if you want to become a blogger or a reporter, you had to register, and the cost was $920. I mean, how many people can afford $920 to register to do these things? So some of these uh, issues, issues of internet shutdowns, we've already talked about the internet being an enabler, helping us to go to school. So you are shutting down the internet because of political reasons, and you're just keeping people off and off and off. So I think that's uh, <coughs> some of the things I can look at, but not to be all negative. I can say that there's been a lot of positive things. Um, there have been a lot of positive developments. If you look at Africa in the last five years, at least the, the numbers have gone up, at least we have more people online, and the cost, the $16 that you showed us earlier actually was worse maybe five years ago. So I think that would be my intervention for now, and uh, I'll be happy to indulge more during the breakout. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, you will have space for your questions after everybody has given uh, his or her intervention. So, okay, Talal, please. Thank you. So. Um, from the digital rights perspective, I think when we talk about digital inclusion, um, I think two factors are very important. Um, where if you want to evaluate a society against digital inclusion, I think two factors are very important. The first is to what extent a society uh, allows people to express themselves freely online. Uh, and the second factor is to what extent people are able to freely associate mm -hmm. with others in the cyberspace. Um, when it comes to Pakistan, I think we have had our highs as well as lows against these two factors. Um, talking about the highs in Pakistani society, I think uh, internet has definitely provided us the space. Uh, it has particularly provided the space to the marginalized communities to talk about all those issues which could not become part of the mainstream media. Um, let me give you the context of the Pakistani society. Um, 
Uh, in, for a very long time, human rights defenders and marginalized groups have had a hard time in talking about the human rights violations and also taking a critical assessment of the security policies. Um, these pressures continue to exist, and as a result, 88% of the journalists in Pakistan self-censor themselves. So in the midst of these pressures, internet was a medium where they could you know, talk about all these sensitive issues. Um, however, uh, the, low, uh, the laws uh, of the internet freedom uh, uh, emerged very soon. Um, uh, initially, the reaction of the state was that they would take down websites, they would request Facebook and Twitter to censor pages, they would censor some websites. But initially, we thought that probably um, that is the maximum extent to which the state could go. However, things change, changed drastically in 2017 when four bloggers were allegedly picked up and uh, their apparent crime was that they were managing Facebook pages that were very critical of these security policies. And uh, that incident sent a very strong message. And the message was that if you try to cross red lines over the internet, you will not be spared. And unfortunately, that was not the only incident. Um, many instances have been reported. And just two weeks ago, uh, the web owner of a news channel, uh, the, the, web owner, the web owner and producer of an online news channel was arrested under anti-terrorism laws, uh, anti-terrorism clauses of cybercrime law. Um, and the apparent crime was that he was defaming the judiciary. You can clearly see that defamation of judiciary itself is a very subjective term. And uh, now, you know, anti and using, using the anti-terror clauses to uh, punish somebody for this crime is, again, uh, it's, 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 and it has been unparalleled. It hasn't been witnessed in Pakistan as well. So, um, uh, and you know, uh, these, these threats uh, are there, you know, physical threats, physical threats as a result of digital expression are there. But more, more uh, prominent threats are uh, the online harassment. Um, the more frequent ones are, you know, if, if, you, if you say something, you can, uh, be an, you can be a victim of online harassment. You can f face mere campaigns. So these are the, the ones, these are the strategies that are more frequently used um, uh, by some, um, some elements within the deep state. Now, uh, how do we get out of this situation when you have journalists, when you have HRDs, when you have marginalized groups who came to the internet in the first place to talk about sensitive issues, but as a result of these digital threats, they do not face, uh, they, they do not uh, feel safe. Uh, so um, at the moment, I think that the digital rights community uh, is trying to document all these violations because, you know, if somebody gets picked up, it does not get reported in the media as well. So you have to, you know, find a way to report these incidents and you have to find a way to, you know, take up with the Ministry of Human Rights as well. Uh, at, as part of my work at, uh, as a digital rights advocate in Pakistan, I'm running the Digital Rights Monitor, which is, which is essentially a news website. And I, I believe that, you know, without documenting these instances, there is no way we can advocate for any change. And lastly, I think that um, uh, uh, the, the, the digital rights activists, they are fighting the war against these, these encroachments alone. Uh, there, is a, there, there needs to be a broader participation from other civil society organizations, from other, from other sectors, uh, from private sector, from media. Uh, they need to understand that digital rights violations are a serious issue and it could have long-term implications on all of us. So these are uh, some interventions from my side on the digital rights as well. Thank you very much, Tala. Now we are going to talk a little bit about the media ecosystem. So Daniel from SEMA. Great, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here to be talking about these inclusion issues from the perspective of uh, the news media, journalists uh, in particular. And what I want to say is, my, my argument is that basically that the internet is keeping us from the news. And I know that that's kind of maybe a provocative thing to say, but I want to explain kind of where I'm coming from with this. Uh, you know, over the past decade we've seen um, significant changes to the news media market and the ability of uh, news institutions to support themselves financially as the, the, the model of advertising has changed with the uh, development of new dissemination uh, channels for news, particularly with social media, with news aggregators online. And so this has been, pr pr created a real challenge for news media institutions uh, that support journalists and support independent reporting because you don't have a financial way to support this really important work that we need in our society so that citizens have access to high quality, reliable information. Um, and at first you might be hearing this and you might think, oh, well this is really a sectoral issue that just affects media institutions or journalists. Why does this matter to the, the broader public? But really this is key to all of us because 
the internet is this amazing platform for, for news and information to help inform us, to help us make better decisions. Uh, and if we have this kind of societal layer, the, the news media system, broken, we'll, we see uh, a, a further deterioration in how democracy is working worldwide. And I think if you look at the past 10 years, you can kind of see how kind of this crisis in the media uh, system has uh, perhaps had some negative effects on how democratic governance is working. Um, and it's interesting that this is really paradoxical for some of us because, for me included, because, you know, when the internet kind of first came to uh, uh, a global scale in the 1990s, we really saw it as this incredible opportunity for new voices to enter uh, into, uh, you know, the barrier to entry to share news and information was much lower. But really what we're finding uh, more and more with how people use the internet uh, and the larger concentration into large tech platforms is that there's actually less media diversity than we thought. People want to go to sites where news is constantly uh, being updated, kind of sticky sites, and so that means you have to, the news aggregators, uh, social media are very popular, and so, so that means that the advertising revenue isn't being filtered back into uh, the institutions that support journalists, support news media. Um, and so we're actually seeing uh, a deterioration of that. Um, and also, uh, it's not just having knowledge of uh, an internet connection in HTML. You have to have a lot more, uh, uh, you know, technical knowledge in order to create platforms that encourage people uh, to come visit them. So really the challenges uh, to the news media ecosystem are, are, are very uh, difficult. Um, you know, the, the internet's an amazing uh, opportunity to share information and knowledge, but we're, we can't be concerned solely with just access. We also have to be concerned about the quality of access. And so that's really what uh, this issue is about. And, um, uh, you know, I think that the internet's keeping us from the news, but there's things that we can do, especially at a global level, thinking about the policies that can support independent media. So uh, I would love to, uh, talk with you guys in the breakout session about some of those ideas that I have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. So now we are coming to this uh, very interesting cluster called society, what we call society. And um, Osama, you can share experiences from, from India. Yeah, uh, yeah, so most of the unconnected society in any case lives in India. So. Uh, so out of, uh, you know, 1.3 billion people, about close to a billion people are unconnected in India. So we have, and we also have the one of the highest connected people also uh, contributing to the world. So uh, I, I want to share two stories to you. Uh, one, how digital inclusion is actually resulting in digital exclusion. And, uh, and so it's a negative story and the other one is a more positive story. So the negative story is that there is this woman in a village in India who is actually a daily wage worker and she uh, has to get her wages every day in the evening or she is dependent on uh, ration which is uh, government entitlements. But she can't avail even a single entitlement without going through a biometric identification, which is actually dependent on a database, which is supposed to be connected through the internet. And more often than not, about 37 to 40 percent of such women or a man who are living in villages who are dependent on daily wages, wages or ration do not get their biometric either correctly identified or internet doesn't work, so database doesn't get connected, or they are asked to come back again, or they are said that, you know, even if it matches, you can only take one kgs of rice rather than 15 kgs of rice. So, you know, so this d digital inclusion actually created a mandate for the government to make it mandatory that you have to go through the biometric without really making the digital infrastructure available without having a fault in it. So, you know, so this actually digital inclusion is resulting in digital inclusion, and this is just not one woman. We have about 350 million people who are dependent daily on a ration or a government entitlement without which they cannot eat their minimum requirement of food on a monthly basis. 
So this is one example, and this may be the condition and situation in many, many more developing countries and many, many more countries where you know, connectivity is not available. The second example is that there is this person who is a folk musician. He remembers 250 songs in a language which has no script, and he's a beautiful singer. But he has, got, he has been using mobile to record all his music and all his folk music to not to let it die because you know, in the coming generation, everybody may not be able to memorize all the 250 or 300 songs or the folk music or the language that you speak which doesn't have a script. So this is, this is another digital inclusion which is actually resulting in uh, saving many languages and, you know, uh, preserving many of the culture and folk and music and art and heritage, which most of these world which has people uh, without connectivity actually lives in because if you really uh, look at 300 uh, you know uh, 3.5 billion people who are not connected and if you demographically uh, give them a category you will find that they are poor they are tribals they are they live in remote areas they have great and huge heritage culture uh, and language and you know something that you would love to preserve so i think digital may be a very very you know interesting tool to uh, you know preserve it is that all the time that I think I guess I have? Thank you. Thank you very much, Osama. So, and, and uh, now our last cluster uh, about innovation. Bonjour. <laughs> um, did I pronounce it correctly? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rose. So, innovation. I think all of us know about how technology and the internet brought up a lot of innovations and innovative solutions into our lives, like just a tap on our phone, we'll get the food delivered on our table or on our doorstep. But this isn't true for most people. Like, um, as Stefan mentioned, 42% has just connected. So in the Philippines, 63% of the people are connected to the internet. It's quite higher compared to other Asian countries, but the, the concentration of the connectivity is only at the urban areas. And as, a, as an island, the Philippines still a lot of things to do in terms of providing connectivity to the people. So the, the innovation ecosystem in the Philippines is thriving, but then there are, you know, an opposite and totally um, different portion of the society, the digital gap and the digital divide. So there are people who are highly connected to the internet. They are so innovative. They are just using our smartphones to do everything that we want to do. But there are farmers and there are health workers who have no internet connection. So what we are doing right now um, in my organization as Women Powered, we are trying to bridge the gap by bringing together the community and the tech community to develop an innovative solutions to help the community where, don't, where they don't have access to the internet and come up with the solutions that is participatory and make sure that the innovation that they develop address to the specific needs of the community. So I've been organizing social innovation camp, uh, startup weekends, and we always make sure that the problem that they're trying to solve is it resonates to the, to the market, to the users that they want to um, address to. So we make sure that they go out and interview the people at the community instead of the other way around, that they develop something and then when they go to the community, it's useless because first, there is no internet and there is no other option to use the app and so it's not sustainable. Way back in 2014, we developed a um, healthcare app in an urban community in Metro Manila actually. But after a year, it didn't sustain because there is no internet connection. The, the local government unit didn't provide internet connectivity, and so the app was useless. Health workers went back to the paper, um, paper and pen documentation of the health status of the community, and they forget the application. So there is a lot of innovative solutions. A lot of people want to develop an application, a web application, a blockchain technology that could address fake news. But the question is, how can we sustain it? How can we sustain the, all these innovations? So from my experience, um, when we do workshop on, on developing innovative solutions, we make sure that stakeholders are 
are on the same table. Uh, we make sure that the tech community, the developers, the programmers, go to the community, reach out to them, and ask them questions that um, what are their needs? What is the current situation in the community? Do they have internet? Because it's useless for them to develop an app for the farmers to cut the middleman and provide the e-commerce platform if the farmers couldn't even use it because they are just using the, the old phone. They are not using the iPhone or the smartphones that we've been using, right? So it means that it's important for us to build the digital um, gap by making sure that we connect to the community and to the, to the people at the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid who needs all these innovative solutions for them to participate. Because these are the people who are the marginalized. These are the people who has no opportunity to participate because they don't have access to technology. And when we will just let that happen, the more that they are left behind in participating in democratic activities, in e-commerce, in online payments, and the digital divide will just go further and further. So later I will be excited to share my experience and how we, we do that and how it can help your organization to develop a program. So thank you very much for your interventions. You have been so great keeping the time. And so we now will have time for discussion. Um, before we start the discussion, maybe one question to the audience. Um, we hear about negative, a lot of negative developments in the digital world, but also positive developments. So if I ask you, okay, do we have in five years from now a better digital world? Who would say, yes, I agree, we will have a better digital world? And who would say, no, it's getting worse? So who is the optimistic part? Raise your arms. <laughs> Okay, some of them, but not all. So there are some pessimists, I imagine. <laughs> Please raise your arms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And maybe this is also for discussion now, because we, what we want to do now is um, that please split up in five groups. We have colleagues from Deutsche Welle Academy and partners who will uh, be your facilitators and you can gather in five groups. Um, in each group we will have an expert and we really want to discuss and want to know from you, okay, what would you consider the most pressing topics of digital inclusion? Because this is called um, hidden aspects of digital inclusion. So what would you add as important topics? And even more importantly, what would you say are the promising solutions? Don't be afraid of the interactive part, because after that, what we want to do is come together again and then in short intervention know what each group has worked out. Um, so if there's somebody in a group who would like to be the rapporteur, it would be great, but also we can do it, uh, the colleagues of Deutsche Welle. It's Julius, Lena, Roslin, Kuda, where is Kuda? Yeah, hello, and me, so we are facilitators and um, now we can start with, uh, you have prepared some signs, so we have to try to gather a little bit and uh, use the room, so maybe in each corner you can come together in the groups, okay? And it's about 20 minutes of discussion, we're going to put it on some flip chart paper and then come together again and discuss in total. Thank you.
like this. <laughs> I have a micro. So please come a little bit closer, as I said, and so we can discuss the, the, the results of your discussions. It was really interesting. Um, we have here from the part of uh, Roslyn, what was it? Who, who's going, you're going to present? Yeah, please. So we start with society. Um, please come to the micro so that we can um, have it for the remote participants too. We need to talk into the micro. Okay, so in our uh, group we were kind of, okay, society is quite a big remit and how do we kind of take it apart from access and the other things that the other groups are talking about. And so we first looked at the overall kind of um, system in which we operate and live and how there needs to be some questions around what our social norms are. And at the moment, are we kind of existing and working and operating in a patriarchal system, which is very much uh, built upon imperialism and colonialism, and this uh, structure needs to be questioned and changed for society as a whole? Uh, We've also talked about the power structure bubble with uh, very few people actually having power over the internet and um, what that means for, for exclusion. The fact we operate in a capitalist system was uh, brought up and questioned as whether this is the system that would uh, bring about inclusion for all. Uh, the kind of connected and the hyper-connected versus the unconnected being one of the biggest problems that we're encountering and then how information is, um, is consumed and produced and who's the person producing it and ultimately the majority being the consumers and the impact that has on what is being consumed and the messages and opportunities that are um, missed by the lack of inclusion. Uh, Osama spoke a bit about different examples from India regarding this to do with just basic things like tourism and hotels and restaurants and uh, cultural areas that don't get any um, coverage because they're not online. We then looked at solutions and so for solutions uh, public broadband access is one area where it's something that's um, public opportunity, not something that's provided by um, a service provider such as Facebook or you know, it's actually um, for all. Um, we looked at antitrust regulation and the fact that um, at the moment power is with very few companies and this should be rectified. Obviously our promising solution is a feminist internet which helps to change some of the norms and the system in which we operate and the power structure. We looked at uh, more um, consumer focused initiatives such as the GDPR which has come about which is looking at how you know the rights of society, um, capacity building and open knowledge um, and then obviously uh, media and information literacy as a way for people to also be empowered um, with that through access but being able to access with uh, the skills to do so. Yeah. That's us. Yeah, great. So looking at the time, we have 10 minutes left, so please maybe we come to the next uh, uh, topic, digital rights. Who's going to, are you going to report? Like two minutes, okay. Yes. Um, Yes, my name is Daniel Bilopio, um, a youth IGF fellow 2018. So um, we've looked at the issues of access, but the good thing is that most people that participated in this group <coughs> were all, sorry, were mostly from Africa, because I think that's the major thing that is affecting um, uh, people from uh, that region. So some of the things we looked at are aspects that uh, range from political, social, and economic. Uh, most of the economic, we've seen it with uh, taxes that are placed on some of uh, the internet platforms, uh, such as social media platforms, when it comes to uh, countries like Tanzania, access for websites and all uh, those other things. So we also looked at the issue of uh, content um, censorship when it comes to issues of access. Before you uh, relay a certain kind of information on the internet, you're supposed to um, seek authorization from the government. Once the government agrees with that kind of information 
or that data, then you release it. If it's contrary to, you can't release that. So we also looked at issues on access for disabled uh, persons and uh, marginalized persons. Yes, um, we looked at barriers to innovation because of um, um, the problems with this access. So some of the promising solutions that uh, we looked at, um, legal strategies, uh, such as uh, public interest litigation cases that are filed to challenge some of these um, unfair censorship policies, such as the tax policies. We also looked at uh, fair uh, spectrum distribution policies in that uh, various competing companies within the same space can rely on uh, the same kind of broadband to ensure that uh, access is extended to places that initially never had such. So we also looked at um, creating uh, community networks to be able to um, enhance access in places where persons are unable to afford economically to be on uh, the internet. Then um, promoting relevance of the internet. We established that in some of the African countries like Tanzania and Uganda, there are, for example, Wi-Fi hotspots in several places, but uh, not only are they not trusted by the people around them, but even the people that have access to some of these spots don't understand why they need to be able to connect uh, to those uh, spots. So we need to promote uh, relevance of the internet. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, the next one, who's, who wants to? Kuda, please. Talking about? Uh, digital rights. So, digital rights. Yeah. Yeah. so we were talking about digital rights and the basic issues that we identified were the fact that um, there's need to fix, in summary, there's need to fix the offline institutions. So that's like your independent institutions and your constitutions and your legal frameworks in country and then use these to protect rights or to protect people's digital rights in the online world. And the other issue that we identified was a lack of of government policies as one part. The second part is that government policies, specifically government laws, can be overbroad. So these laws are then used to persecute people. Um, examples were given about how this is done in Nigeria as well as in Pakistan. And then the other topic that we identified was the lack of awareness that leads to people not being able to stand up and fight and demand the protection of their rights in online environments. And then there was also the issue of cyber harm. For example, cyber harm includes things like cyber bullying. Generally, it speaks to the lack of people's knowledge on how to promote and protect other people's rights online. And then um, moving on to the promising solutions that we came up with, there's a poly, uh, what we're already doing here partly, which is to put together multi-stakeholders approaches to coming up with solutions that, uh, to the problems that we identified. There's also a need to set up and run um, awareness campaigns. An example was given of the Council of Europe guidelines to respect and protect and fulfill the rights of the children in digital environments. So that's an example of an awareness campaign that's running in Europe. So countries can also identify issues, then run uh, awareness campaigns uh, to address those issues. Another thing is that private companies, when we meet together to talk about the problems in the digital world and digital rights, private companies are sort of left out in the conversation because private companies now are seen to be operating as semi-autonomous, making laws for themselves, so we need to rope them in into the solutions as well. Then the last thing is that uh, we need to use the existing human rights frameworks to promote digital rights. So, great, so uh, the, for the last two clusters, media and um, innovation, please, two minutes now, we have, because we have to leave the room because the next panel is going to start. So innovation. This will be quick. All right, so for the innovation, the discussion